If you want, you can open familiar passage. You can open to 1 Peter 3, uh, 15. Um, same passage we've been looking at throughout our this whole series. So, Nabil Qureshi, anybody heard of him? Nabil Qureshi, some of you? Yeah, he, he was a devout Muslim. Uh, grew up in a, a devout Muslim home. And uh, when he went off to college, his roommate was a Christian. And his, uh, his friend challenged him to examine the claims of, of Christianity. And so it began not only this, this friendship, but this, they would debate one another and they would have uh, vigorous discussions about, about uh, each other's faith. Um, uh, Nabil trying to convince his friend of Islam and, and his friend trying to convince Nabil uh, that the Christian uh, faith was true. And so Nabil began to uh, read the Bible as an unbeliever. He, he began to actually attend church. He was an unbeliever, but he was going to church because he was investigating the claims, and he took lots of notes, and uh, he would talk to various pastors and, and even interview uh, theologians. And um, after much research and, and prayer, and as time had passed by, he began to have these vivid dreams. And in a four-month span, he had three extremely... Uh, vivid dreams that suggested that the that Christianity was indeed uh, true, and that um, that disturbed him. It had a, a major impact on him. And so, after much wrestling uh, and and revisiting the scriptures, he finally uh, surrendered his life to to Jesus Christ. And uh, the book, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite books, actually. I did the, it's called uh, uh, Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. And I actually, I usually don't do a lot of audio books because I get distracted very easily. I'm just, for me, I want to be able to go at my own pace and lay my eyes on it. And, and I usually start thinking of squirrels and all this kind of stuff when I'm listening to audio books. But this one, like I was, I was tuned in the whole time. I think one, because it's a biography uh, in part, but two, also because Nabil actually uh, was reading the story. And so I was just tuned in. So it was just like somebody telling me their story. So I highly, highly recommend it. And what I love about books like that, rather than just like, hey, uh, you know, read a book all about Islam, uh, you learn a lot about the Islamic faith through his, his story. And it's just such a good, uh, rich story. But, you know, much like uh, Nabil's reason reasons for uh, uh, believing, I've been sharing with you uh, my, uh, not my only 25, but I've been sharing with you 25 of the reasons that I personally trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And of course, I've been encouraging you to do the same. First Peter 3.15 says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Put that up on the screen here. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So Peter, in essence, is saying, always be prepared. Uh, you, we need to know why we believe uh, what we believe. As I said before, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a, a Bible scholar, but you need to know why you believe what you believe in, and we need to be prepared to be able to give a reason to why we believe what we believe. And so just hoping to encourage you through um, the reasons that, that, uh, that I believe. And uh, much like Nabil's uh, journey, my uh, belief isn't just based on evidence and intellect. And that's what we've been doing so far, right? I, I started with what we call general revelation. And uh, I've been, you know, we're talking about the uh, the, the, the cosmos and our planet, you know, and, and, and things from astronomy down to, you know, biology, you know, for 
things that just fascinate me and actually draw me closer uh, to God. And then we got into um, archaeology and, and, and biblical uh, evidence for why the Bible is, 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 is true. And then we got into prophecies, right? Uh, um, the, 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 not only the claims that Jesus made, but the things that were uh, predicted and prophesied about him in the Old Testament that he fulfilled. It's just astonishing in the different... Um, the different festivals and traditions that Jesus fulfilled um, uh, add to the reasons that I believe, but also uh, I have uh, experiential reasons for believing. Just like Nabil, right? He, he, he not only uh, studied and examined um, uh, the evidence for Christianity, but he experienced God, right? And one of the things he found, as opposed to the, the, the Muslim faith, is that, that the Christian God was a very personal God. He wasn't a detached God. He was a God that was intimately involved in our lives. And, and I hope to show you this morning, just by my own experiences, that we have a God that is not just a God locked up in the pages of scriptures, but he is, he is alive and he is active, right, in our lives. And, and the living word of God is moving through the Holy Spirit and is working today. So that's uh, where I hope to go this morning. And uh, we've gone through 19 reasons so far that I trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And we're on number 20. Number 20 is answered prayers. Uh, the answered prayers that I've witnessed uh, in my life and, and also in the lives of others. 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have towards God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we ask of him. And so I remember one of my stories. I've jotted down a bunch of different stories through. I'm going to quickly go through uh, some of them. Um, and some of these stories, forgive me if some of you've heard me, because some of you guys have known me personally for a while. And so either from the pulpit or just, you know, having lunch club or something, you may have heard uh, some of these stories. But that's the thing about, you know, being a pastor preaching every week. Sometimes you just get to hear stories over and over and over again. Uh, <laughs> as a young college kid, um, I was just uh, getting my, my feet wet, and I was going to community college, and I was also working at a restaurant, Humble City Cafe in Humble, and um, so I was gaining my independence, and I had a car, and I was uh, 85 uh, Sunfire, 85 Sunfire, and, but it was like, this was like 1995, 1996, and so I was driving myself to school and driving myself uh, to work. And my car broke down. And it had broken down a few times, right? And we had gotten it fixed. But this time, it was kaput. Like, it wasn't going to be revived. And we were not the richest of families, right? And uh, we didn't have the money to get me a new car. And suddenly, I had no transportation. And I'm like a first-generation college kid. Like, my, one of my brothers went to college. And so I was looking forward. You know, I wanted to to further my education and as I was out there working and stuff like that. And man, this like just really got me not just depressed, but scared. And I remember literally being on my face, weeping, saying, God, please, you know, it was a big deal to me. God, please help me, help me. You know, I don't know how I'm going to get <laughs> where I need to go. And I'm not recommending this, especially if you're uh, if you have gambling issues. And this wasn't me. I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't go out and purchase a lottery ticket. But my father won won the lottery, like the minor lottery. He won thirty thousand dollars within a couple days of my of my prayer. And uh, so I'm not for or against the lottery. I am against gambling addictions and stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's just a caution. I'm not. I'm not vouching for the lottery necessarily, but my dad won the lottery, and with that thirty thousand, not with the whole thirty thousand, but he he bought me a used car and was able to get me back on the road. It's amazing how God works. Um, about early on in our church days, uh, we had gone through some some uh, 
some issues where we needed a, a church space. We had actually tried to get started. We were in our home and we had stepped out into a school. And uh, long story short, after that first year, uh, it was a rough year and we ended up back in the home and we were looking for a new church space. I was praying about it. My, my two boys, uh, Zane and Daxton, they went to uh, this uh, learning center, this tu tutoring service called Grade Power Learning. Uh, off of 242 and 45. And so I was uh, there uh, waiting on them. They were in their class and the owner, she was talking to me and asking me about the church. And I was explaining to her what was going on. We were looking for a place and she was like, well, um, you know, uh, you're welcome to use use this place if you'd like. And, and I thought it was a very nice gesture. But as I looked around, I was like, ah, you know, this is not really conducive to having church, you know, in here. But that was a nice, a nice thought. And so anyways, I got up and, and I went to lunch around the corner. And as I turned the corner and went into Jack's Burgers, it was one of my favorite burger places, and I walked in and the first thing I noticed on the door is said, closed on Sundays. I was like, God, what are you doing here? <laughs> and so I went and sat down and like, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, hey, talk to the owner. And I didn't want to do it. I just thought it was weird, you know, and I'm sitting there. And he walks by and he's kind of checking. He's like, hey, uh, how you doing? You doing all right? And I'm like, good. And I was like, hey, uh, could I ask you a question? He's like, what? And I was like, uh, what do you think about having a, uh, what would you think about having a, a church service here? And he just turned and he sat down at the table and we began to talk. And next thing I know, I walked out of there and we had a place to meet, not only a place to meet in Jack's Burgers, but around the corner, our kids had a place and grade power learning for all of our kids to go and and, uh, and, and learn. And so that was awesome. God opened a, a, a door. Well, we were there for a summer. Sometimes God just provides for a season, right? He gives you your daily bread when you need it, you know, for that season. And uh, after the summer, uh, I was already going through a bunch of trials. Uh, I'd, I, Courtney had been in and out of the hospital and I'd been in the hospital. We had some crazy disease uh, that I've told a lot of you about. But um. Uh, as soon as I got out of the hospital and I returned to church, uh, the guy who ran the Jack's Burgers, he's like, hey, Scott, he's like, I'm sorry to tell you this. He franchised it out. He was like, um, we're not going to be able to, you know, I'm not going to be able to continue on with the business. I'm just struggling with it. And I'm going to have to turn it over to the owner owner who owned all the Jack's. And uh, I was like, OK, what does this mean? He's like, I don't know. He's like, here's his phone number. Uh, you can reach out to him. And so I reached out to him and it turns out that the owner Jack's did not know that this guy was renting out the place to us, and he wasn't very happy about it. And um, not only did we not have a place to meet, like even the next Sunday, we didn't have a place to get together and, and, and meet at church. And so, again, I'm in an anxious panic. I'm like, oh, no, I do not want to go back to the house for a third time. All that pride or whatever, but I did not want to go back to the house for a third time. And so I'm letting the whole church know, hey, pray. We don't have a place uh, to meet. And um, a woman called who uh, had opened up a little boutique in Old Town Spring that was uh, in our, our church. And uh, some of you guys have known she's been in and out uh, here, Sabrina. And she was like, hey, you ever thought about Old Town Spring? I was like, oh, I'd been a part of a church plant there, you know, here in Old Town Spring before, and we had a lot of issues with parking and all that kind of stuff uh, back then. And so I wasn't looking forward to it, but I was like, God, if this is what you're doing, you know, I'll go check it out, man. And I came and the price was just right. Mr. Wu's our landlord, and uh, he had a place downstairs and a place upstairs, and, and we rented them out. We had a place the next week to meet uh, for church, and it was just a good price that we could afford at the time, which wasn't much, you know. And, uh, and we had a place to meet. It was actually uh, the place where y'all are sitting right there. That was, um, that was actually the children's area and upstairs, because if people are upstairs, you can hear people, you can hear every little footstep. And so uh, the sanctuary was upstairs and the children were downstairs. And so we just slowly kind of expanded and, and taken over. But God, God came through the same day. I needed leadership in the church. Like, like bad. There was a time where uh, we we worship we had a worship service with MP3s and just lyrics on on the screen, right? And uh, I didn't have a guy like Luke, you know, and 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 we didn't have a, a children's 
uh, somebody to, you know, for, we had children's people, but not uh, a children's uh, director uh, per se. And we needed uh, leadership in the church and something I'd been praying for uh, for a long time. And uh, it took a few years, but then uh, along came uh, Doug and Maggie Horton. Those of you who are part of the anniversary service, I talked about that a little bit. That was a huge answer prayer for us because it filled all those needs in one day. <laughs> like they just showed up and was like, God, okay, God was like, here's your answer prayer now. Um, then there was another time that uh, uh, we had some, uh, see, I don't, all right, so let me preface this by saying, I don't know what each of you give individually to the church. I feel like a pastor better not knowing. I don't want to be like, oh, why does this person give and this person doesn't? And not, you know, I just, I don't want to know what people give. Um, but I, I, <laughs> I do know sometimes, like I knew that this, this, uh, this couple was a, they were big givers uh, in the church. And at the time, like right now, our giving is a lot more s- spread out. But at the time, they had a bulk of, of what they gave to the church. Well, they had a special needs kid. And so... Uh, we weren't able to meet their needs at the time, and so they were, they uh, they had moved on. And a uh, very sweet couple, very good friends of ours. But um, anyways, like there went our our giving, and I was stressed about that. And my wife made me pull out a sheet of paper and write down my worst fears, and give it to God and pray, you know. And I had that list on my fridge because God like met everything that I asked for on that sheet of paper, and like literally. Like our bank account was like almost down to like a thousand bucks, which is not good. And uh, it went from 3,000 a short time later to 13,000 in one week. And uh, God is good. God is good. And then Doug, man, he served as an elder here and uh, he was here for a few years. And then, and then he left and he got a, a higher paying uh, a position at another church. Nothing wrong with that. And he got another uh, position and we blessed them. They went on and, and uh, not only did I lose an elder, but I lost, I lost m- my worship leader. And so I, I put a job listing out on social media. There was, the whole time that was up, there was only like three answers on that. The other two were no fits. You know, it just didn't fit well with what, you know, our church was and stuff like that. But the first person that answered was the, like, the very next day that I put that listing up. And it was um, uh, Joey Lazzotti. And he... He led in our church, very good worship leader, and he led for a year and a half. And so God provided, you know, at the right time. Joey needed us, and, and we needed him, and, and he came in and, and, uh, and led. Um, some of you, some of you guys have been around for a while might remember, or maybe just in general, because it made, like, not just local news, but national news, uh, the Church of Lucifer uh, was on the other street. Uh, not, you know, what's the other street over there? This is... Um, this is Gentry, uh, the other one. You know, there's another street parallel to this. But anyways, no, not Spring Cypress. Uh, it's when it forks off over there. Main Street. Okay, Main Street. Yes, it's Main Street. So on Main Street, you had the little Church of Lucifer uh, that had um, moved in. I always thought it was interesting, like, people were very afraid and up in arms around Old Town Spring. And I was like, man, there's a lot of other darkness going around Old Town Spring. And because this has the name Lucifer, like everybody's tripping out. But anyways, there was a lot of uh, fear around it. Uh, I remember uh, there were some churches that were like out front protesting, you know, and the, the people at the Church of Lucifer, they were just eating it up. You know, they were all, they were enjoying all the media attention and dancing outside and stuff like that. And, and just kind of, that's what they wanted, right? <laughs> And um, so anyways, um, the churches of, from the Old Town Spring Heights Community Association, the churches we're associated with, we all got together and there was a, a little uh, shop um, uh, not too far from here in Old Town Spring. And they, they would sell items and those items would go to missions. So it was a Christian couple that was, that was doing it. And so we held a, a prayer service there. And so we worshiped, Doug was a part of it, and uh, we, we worshiped, and then we, we prayed um, for them. We didn't want to be a part of the protests and everything, and so we, we prayed for them. Well, uh, apparently there was other churches that were doing the same. They weren't taking that same protest approach, and they were praying for them, and they were taking it a step further. There's an Assembly of God church across the freeway that actually went over there. Somebody had vandalized uh, the property, uh, the building of that the Lucifer Church, and they went and asked if they could help them repair that the building. And um, 
like a month later, <clears throat> one of the two founders of the Church of Lucifer walked into that Assembly of God church and went into the pastor's office and was in there for four hours and gave his life to the Lord. It's the power of God. And I actually watched the live stream. His wife and he were, uh, when they were baptized, and they also renewed their vows because they had gotten initially married uh, in the church of Lucifer, and they gave their life to Jesus Christ, and the place shut down. Um, and then, man, I, I prayer like I had, Courtney and I had school loans for like 13 years, and <laughs> they were barely moving, right? And that was, that was a prayer of mine, God, you know, and it, uh, please, you know, help us to pay off these, these loans. And um, we were moving out of our neighborhood, and my mom, we didn't want to leave her in the neighborhood, and so we got with her, and we made a decision, hey, let's, let's move in together. And so now she's got a mother-in-law suite. Well, my mother is, um, she's a widow of a disabled Vietnam vet, and she got tax breaks. And so when we got into the home, she got these tax breaks, and it reduced our mortgage a lot, and we rolled all of that into our school loans and paid it off in like a year and a half. Candace, some of y'all heard me tell the story uh, about her years ago. Um, she was diagnosed with a terminal illness and that she was going to, uh, may not make it a year. And uh, we were all praying for her and a gentleman in our neighborhood, a friend of theirs stopped her and prayed over her and she went back to the doctor. Oh, there must be some mistake. <laughs> You're fine. Little things. The other day, here's confession time. Um, I misplaced the gift card that the church gave us. It's like, that's $125 to a steakhouse. And, you know, <laughs> and I really want to go on date night. And I don't want to tell the church that we, lo you know, lost this gift card. And we're looking and we're tearing up the house looking for this thing. And uh, we couldn't find it. And Courtney said, did you pray? And I was like, yeah, I was praying as I was going. And she's like, no, let's stop and pray now. So we stopped and grabbed each other's hands, and, and we prayed over it. Man, like 10 minutes later, I look in a place that had already looked, and there was the card. I opened the card, and it was, it was in there. And, I, you know, I don't think that it was, like, missing at first, you know? And, uh, but I think God opened my eyes to see it, <laughs> you know, when I went back and checked and found this, this card. And just those little things I don't take for granted and always give God glory. You could sit there and go, oh, well, maybe that's a coincidence. Don't do that. Just give God the glory, right? Just give God the glory. Um, he works in coincidences all the time. They're divine coincidences. Um, you know, Garth Brooks in the 90s, he had a song called Unanswered Prayers. Any of y'all heard of that song? Uh, and it's a good, it's a good story in, in the song about God. Um, Things not going, if, if, if God would have answered prayers the way that he had wanted at times, then, then he would, it wouldn't have been good, right? And so he's thanking God for unanswered prayers. But I'm not so sure that, any, that our prayers, unless we're just resisting God and we're not in a good place, then our prayers may fall on deaf ears with God. The Bible talks about that. But I don't think he, he doesn't answer any of our prayers. I think he answers all of our prayers. It's just that it's yes or no. See, that's the, that's the thing is we don't, you know, no is an answered prayer. God just says no. But a lot of times he says, wait, be patient. And we see that all through scripture where people have to wait. And sometimes years and a long time, they have to wait. And then we see actually getting into eschatology and revelation that he's, he's got the prayers of the saints stored up. And so there's prayers that they will be fulfilled and, and, and they will come uh, to fruition. Or he says, not like you think. So yes, no, wait, or yes, but not like you think. You think this way, but the Holy Spirit knows better, right? And he knows what you really need. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer according to... To what, what you need one and what my will is and what my purpose is and all this that you can't see the whole, the whole story. So as we close on uh, number, reason number 20, I just um, I encourage you to, uh, we talk a lot about gratitude lists, right? And, and, and uh, making a gratitude list and thinking about the little and the big things that we're, we're thankful for. Um, 
Also, I encourage you to meditate on the ways that God has answered prayers in the past. The psalmists do it all the time. David, you'll see in the Psalms where he's struggling, right? He's in a bad place. He's not in a good place. And he starts, not only does he think about his forefathers and what God has done, and he starts remembering those and he starts recounting those, but also the way God has worked in his life. So I encourage you to think in the past the way that God has come through in big ways, but then also in in small ways. And I believe it'll create in you gratitude and a good frame of mind in your approach to God. And then ask yourself, is God worth trusting today with the problems that I have today? Number 21, dreams that I believe came from God. Acts 2.17, in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall uh, dream dreams. And we saw an uptick in this after the day of Pentecost. Between the day of Pentecost and, and, and 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, we saw this big uptick uh, with the apostles and, and all these signs and dreams. And, and in a sense, that was the last days. That was a transition uh, between the old covenant and the new covenant. But also, in another sense, we are still in the last days and we've been in the last days since the time of, of Pentecost, right? So he's not talking about end times like in the future. This is the last days. The advent of Jesus brought on the last days, the Christian um, era. And he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall uh, dream dreams. Um, I remember as a little boy, um, I had a dream and I remember I was standing on a beach and all of a sudden there was a ship and it was, it was moving forward. And then all of a sudden it started looking like it was going backwards. And I was like, huh. That's interesting. And then I realized that it, w- it wasn't the ship that was moving. It was like the land that was moving. And all the land came together like Pangea, like one big clump of, of land. And in the middle of all this land was this little church, like a little white church, no bigger than this, this sanctuary. And I walked in and seating was like this and there were people uh, sitting down and we were standing in line. And so they would sit down and then a preacher would come in and he would, uh, he would give a message and then they would get up and they would move to another line. And then we came and we sat down and then he would come in and he preached the message. And then we got up and we got in the line. And I was curious as I got in the line after the message, like, what's going on here? And there was a person handing out these cards. And uh, when I got up there, I noticed that there was a card the, basically, it was like separating the sheep and the goats. And uh, when I got my card, it wasn't good. And um, I've said before, I even mentioned it this week, that while um, uh, a fear of, 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 of judgment, you know, because I've never been a, a, like what you call a hellfire and brimstone uh, preacher, that, is, that did not leave me to fall in love with Jesus. But... It got my attention. It got my attention. And Jesus never shied away from it. And I believe in this dream, God was uh, getting my attention, (laughs) that I wasn't in the right place and my heart wasn't in the right place. The most vivid dream I ever had was first few years in ministry. And there's too much to go into um, because it was a very detailed and very symbolic dream. But uh, basically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I was on an elevator, went up on this tall skyscraper, and on that skyscraper was a city. There were cars and streets and shops and homes and people living up there, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. I was visiting and fellowshipping with a bunch of different people, like even people that I knew and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, when I'm in awe about how awesome this city was, um, uh, all of a sudden it dawned on me that this 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 building didn't have really a good foundation. And this is like, I mean, this was like up in the clouds, very tall buildings and people are living up there. And I was like, man, a big storm comes through. This could be devastating. And immediately the scene changed and I was on a a freeway and people were in cars that I knew that were all around me. And uh, I look ahead and there's this big F5 tornado in the middle of the road. And I had no time, but just to say Jesus and close my eyes and went through the tornado. And when I came out the other side, we're in this home and we're all just um, celebrating and thankful that we made it through the storm. And that dream was prophetic. It laid out the first few years of the Haven uh, almost perfectly. 
uh, in the struggles that we went through and that God uh, took us through it. Um, one time I had a dream about that I was sitting at a table with a bunch of people from my past, friends from high school and elementary, and, and uh, I was talking to them and I was sharing the gospel with them and some were interested and some were just completely distracted and, and not interested. And uh, so I decided, I had wrestled with it and I decided to reach out uh, to uh, one of the guys and you just ask how he was doing. Guy didn't talk too much. And on a whim and just asked how he's doing and, and, and said, hey, I had this dream and you were in it and this is what happened. And he asked if we could have lunch. And, uh, you know, he didn't give his life to Jesus, but I was able to minister uh, to him during that time. And so God, like he works in those like what we might call subjective ways. Right. And when we're obedient and we step out, he uses us. He uses us. I don't know how many times I've had to step out in courage where I thought I was going to be foolish or thought it was going to be silly, and God used it uh, for his glory. And I can count. Like, I'm not a person like every dream I'm trying to decipher. You know, this is this dream from God. I can count on one hand those types of dreams um, that I had that I knew uh, that I believe um, were from, from God. Um, number 22. Words that were given to me from other people that I believe came from God. 1 Corinthians 14.3, uh, Apostle Paul's talking about the church, and he talks about, you know, when we, when we come together, he says that, you know, some are prophesying, some are singing psalms and hymns, and, and uh, he says, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and uh, consolation. So don't just think about, like, don't just think about prophecy as, as, as foretelling, right? Telling the future, right? Even Old Testament, it was primarily foretelling. It was primarily uh, uh, encouragement or, or, or warning or, or, or exhortation um, and all for uh, building up the, uh, the community. Um, back, uh, let's see, how long ago was that now? Probably 15, 15 years ago. Uh, when I was just really uh, starting out in ministry, um, I was in seminary, and a woman at work uh, shared with me, and she said, you know, um, I feel like, and I can't remember if it was a dream that she had or if she was just giving me a word, but she said, um, I feel like God's saying that you're about to have a tough road um, ahead, and um, but if you'll just remain faithful, uh, Scott, he, he's promised that he will reward you. And man, I have held on to that through the hills and valleys. And, and when I'm in the, the darkest places, I've held on to that word as a sense of comfort to just be faithful and to persevere. At the beginning of 2017, I was at a pastor's uh, uh, prayer conference, which was so awesome. I went to like three of those things before they actually stopped doing them. But uh, it was like 24 hours of of sessions of prayer, right? And we're praying for these different things. And um, um, there was a man who approached me uh, during that time, and um, he told me that God was about to uh, bless my church and uh, ministry. And that may sound like, oh, well, anybody could, could say that, but like that was something that I needed at the right time. I was not, you know, I was, I was, I was not in a... Uh, not that I wasn't in a good place, but I was, I was really struggling. And uh, it was about that time, like, y'all have heard me say it before, that our church took a turn and got a lot healthier. It was around 2017 um, when our church um, really started to get its roots and become a, a, a healthy, healthy church. And then the um, uh, final one here is... Um, Carlo Redis, uh, Luke Redis, he's uh, president of Compassion United, good friend of mine and Luke's and Katie's. Um, her, his wife uh, sent me a long um, message um, out of the blue uh, one time, and man, her message was like she was reading my mail. 
And she was even saying, she's like, man, I know, I'm, I'm sorry if all this sounds like just a bunch of babble, but I'm just trying to, it's all just like coming to me and I'm trying to like, you know, write it all down. And, and she was very humble about it, which I always appreciated. You know, she's like, you could take it or leave it, but here's just what I feel like the Lord is laying on my heart. And, uh, you know, it had to do with stuff like God or Scott, your, your, your ministry um, is way beyond the church walls and the people that you influence and, and impact. And it was like, again, that was a moment that I, I needed that. And God spoke to me and it was a timely message that just encouraged me and kept me going. Right. And so um, those are some examples. You know, I've also had people, you know, share things with me. I'm like, Okay, I'll, I'll lift it up in prayer, but nothing, nothing came of it, you know. And uh, um, I've had people say, "Thus saith the Lord," and it, no, nothing, nothing came of it. That's why I believe that it's important for us. Two things: I do believe in these things. I believe it's important to stay humble uh, about it as as well. And so, usually, my approach is is that if if I do have something for somebody, say, "Hey, you know." You can you can take this or leave it. Maybe the pizza I ate, you know, earlier today. But <laughs> uh, why, why don't you just pray, you know, pray about it, you know, and then I'll, I'll share with somebody. Because um, I've seen those who are walking around saying, "Thus saith the Lord." You can get into a, a place of spiritual pride um, where you think God's just always speaking to you and nobody else, and just anyways. But I don't want to negate that that I believe that God works through other people and through our words to others. Um, reason 23, signs, I believe, came from God. See, all these today, this morning, are experiential uh, reasons that I trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Um, my wife, in 2006, I think it was, yeah, it had to be because Zane was born in 2006. She was pregnant with my son, and her lymph nodes began to swell, and she had a bump or a lump on, on the side of her neck, and it turns out it was cancer. They found out later um, it was thyroid cancer um, when they went in and did the surgery that she had had that cancer a lot longer than they initially thought, and it ended up damaging her vocal cords. But if she wouldn't have got pregnant, that lymph node wouldn't have swollen uh, swelled up, and she never would have known that she had cancer. God's good. Um, and in that time that we were in the hospital with that weird um, disease or whatever we had, um, before that, I was out of the hospital, you know, sick as I could be for a week. Uh, I went and got blood tests, and it, it was taking days to come back, and so we went and got a blood test at, a, at an emergency clinic, which came back quicker. And also a urine analysis was like, hey, dude, your organs are not doing good. Um, you need to go to the hospital. And by that time, I can barely stand up and I'm throwing up. And my sister-in-law came and got us and she was uh, taking me to the hospital. And um, I'm in a daze. I got my throw up bag and I'm sitting there and I don't hear nothing. I'm just, just everything's just cloudy. The only thing, I swear to you, the only thing that I heard... Apparently had it on KSBJ. I couldn't hear. I, I don't remember any other singing. And then all of a sudden, I hear Mandisa come through saying, this pain isn't going to last forever. It's only going to make you stronger. Hold on just a little bit longer. And at that moment, I knew. I was like, this, all right, this isn't going to take me, but God's wanting to use it. One time I was... Um, Real stressed. See, you're, you're, I'm sorry, your pastor sometimes deals with anxiety, <laughs> as you can tell from these, these patterns. But you see, God has met me in my anxiousness, right? We look at anxiousness, we say, the Bible says, don't be anxious, you sinner, you know? That's not how God works. He loves us in our anxiety and in our worry. He says, no, don't worry because I got it, right? There's no need to worry. Just trust me, I've got it. But man, he's not ready to like whip you every time you're anxious, right? He loves you. And you can see every time that I was anxious that God came through. He's like, I'm not listening to you. You're anxious. That's not how God works. So um, I'm sorry, man. So much of my life is, 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 as a pastor, so a lot of these stories and a lot of these answered prayers were in the context of the church. And um, what shows me that God has been 
with me in my ministry, and I'm so thankful for that. And not just my ministry, it's y'all's church too. I'm just saying from my vantage point. But uh, I was dealing with a situation, and I didn't know how I was going to proceed with it, and it was a very anxious uh, situation, and how to take care of it. And um, long story short, I was uh, getting my tire uh, changed, and it was off of Rayford Road, and I was sitting out on the front porch of this, this building as they were changing my flat tire, and I was praying about it. I was anxious about it. I was praying, and I took a deep breath, and I just kind of sighed, and I looked up, and I see this, like, okay cloud just, like, floating across um, <laughs> floating across the sky, and uh, I was like, oh, thank you, God. I went home and told Corey, I was like, hey, God said he's going to take care of it. He says it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be good. And, like, before the week it ended, he took care of it. Like, it all took care of itself. Like, I didn't even, like, I didn't even have to handle it. it the situation handled uh, itself, and it's pretty cool. I can't really go into it right now, but, um, and even for personal reasons, but, like, the situation took care of itself. God is good. Um, yeah, another situation when uh, when we were first, uh, well, no, it wasn't when we were first here, but we'd been here for a while, and we didn't have a, a P.O. box or a mailbox here at the church at all at the time, and I'd never received mail. You're not supposed to get mail here, right? Well, um, a guy I went to, to school with, um, elementary and junior high school with, he had been in prison for 16 years, and he'd been trying to locate me. He couldn't, he couldn't locate me and didn't have my address or, or whatever. And he wrote the church. Well, we didn't have a mailbox here. And, uh, like, I got, I got to church early in the morning on Sunday, and there was this, this uh, letter stuck in the side of the door. And uh, the mailman, like, had to have just, like, gone out of their way to deliver that to the doorstep. And I was re- re- able to reconnect uh, for my friend. Uh, with my friend during that time. So that was pretty cool. Um, And then last one on number 23 here, Uh, another friend from elementary school, um, his sister had gone to prison and he kind of, his whole family kind of um, drew away from all of us and from their friends, right? Uh, Because of that whole thing. And there's the whole debate. I won't get into the details, but like whether she was even guilty or not, right? There's some people saying, yes, she was guilty. Other people saying she wasn't of this situation. And uh, I just decided, I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me to reach out to him, right? And um, so I just decided one day to email him and let him know that I don't judge his sister. And I just, I love, you know, you know, I love her. I love him. I love his family. And I just felt like God just wanted me to reach out to you. Dude, he like he he wrote back and he's like, man, this is from God. You know how I know it? He said, because today is the day I'm going to pick her up out of prison. Like, and she had been in for a while. I had no idea. God is good. God is good. Last reason uh, for this morning, just other ways that God has guided me, provided. Uh, and even roadblocks in my life, a lot of my stories when God showed up, it wasn't like, it wasn't this great news, but I've even thanked God when it hasn't been great news because I've always said like, if I know God's in it, then I can handle anything. You know what I mean? Even if it's like bad news or even if it's like, hey, you're going to go through a lot of stuff, you know, but just trust God. Okay, God, I don't want to, but I know that you're you're in it. So here we are, and I'm and I'm I'm trusting you, and so um, um, I remember um, in my uh, first church out of college is where I got my ministry roots. That church uh, was a great church, and then all of a sudden, unfortunately, like unfortunately happens to a lot of more churches than need be, it started to fall apart. Um, some things that were happening in the church, and people began to leave. Uh, the church left and right. And um, again, I was a place that was anxious and I was wanting to leave too. I was wanting to escape. Um, and But I felt like God was telling me to stay. And uh, I, had, I had friends, Christians, that were telling me, you know, trying to show me, hey, Scott, you have, you have every right to, to leave and here's why, right? So they had reasons, and it wasn't sinful, you know, it wasn't sinful reasons. They weren't being deceptive, 
but they were like trying to tell me, you know, from their vantage point, why it was okay for me to move on. But here's the thing. Sometimes God is speaking to you and he's telling you something different than where everybody else, even with good intentions, is trying to guide you. Anybody can relate to that. And so that's what was happening. And like everywhere I went, like I felt it in my spirit, but then like I would turn on the radio and then like I couldn't escape it. It's like there's a lesson of, you know, David and Saul and David is on the run from Saul and God's just saying, hey, just trust me. I'll take care of it. You know, you just trust me and follow me. And I and I held on for a while, but then I ended up leaving like others did. And I've, that's one of my regrets. I regret doing that. I should have stayed. The church ended up folding not too long uh, after that, and I felt like I should have went down with the ship. I just felt like that's what God was telling me uh, to do. Um, I played. A, I prayed a fleece prayer. Anybody familiar with the fleece prayer? You know, and uh, Gideon in the Bible. You know, he's like, "Hey, God, I want to make sure you know that this is you. You know, speaking and laying out like you know." Uh, the fleece, say, if this fleece is wet in the morning, I'll know it's you. And then laying out a wet fleece, if this fleece is dry in the morning, I'll know that uh, you're, you're speaking. I prayed that prayer before um, in a, a situation with a, a couple uh, coming in to lead worship. When we were starting the church, we were looking for a worship leader and to, and to, and to plan a date to start the church and whatnot. And uh, I said, hey, God, if... <laughs> if uh, if this situation, this couple's for you and it's time to start, you know, just make everything go right and good. And if not, God, I just pray that like everything would fall apart, Lord, and I'm there to just trust you. And everybody started to cancel uh, for that group that night where that couple was was coming, like literally, like immediately. I was like, oh, crud. But God was speaking, right? <laughs> and he was trying, you know, he was showing me, you know, this isn't. This is not time. You know, it's not the timing. Um, I, um, my wife, uh, there was a, a, a man that when she was in high school, she was good friends with, and they dated very briefly. But I was so jealous of him because I liked her. And um, so, I, you know, I wasn't his biggest fan back then, but I kept running into him. Like, and when we started the church, I was a waiter. I was like doing it on the side, not waiting, but I was delivering um, for uh, cats, the, you know, New York deli or whatever. And I was delivering and I was setting up and uh, I hear Scott and I turn around and I'm in the middle of the woodlands, like in one of the, you know, buildings in, in the woodlands. And here's this guy in this, you know, business suit all dressed up and he's, he's like, hey, how you doing? You know, and I'm like, good. And immediately again, my pride kicked in and I'm like. I was like, I'm standing here like delivering his food and he's over there and, you know, in a three piece suit. And, and I, I think I even in my insecurity is like, yeah, I'm a past, you know, it, I'm like, I'm pastoring and stuff like that. And this is just, you know, job to help me, you know, get the church started or whatever. And it's funny because I later confessed that to him. And he was like, man, on my end, I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. You know, he's pastoring church and stuff like that. Anyways, um, I ran into him like, three times. And like that second or third time, um, it was at a, a, a restaurant. I was eating by myself for lunch and he was eating by himself for lunch and he was sitting right behind me. He's like, Hey, are you in such and such restaurant? And I turn around and he's sitting right there. And we started talking and, uh, he pulls out this uh, piece of paper and he says, uh, it has a number on it and, um, uh, like dollar amount. And he says, you know, I've been holding on to this uh, and asking God, you know, who he wants me to give it to. And he just said, your church. I became really good friends with David Strobel, such a sweet guy. <laughs> I had him all wrong, you know, from when we grew up, but um, they attended our church for a while. Um, real good dude. But I mean, that money was money that the church needed at the time. And it helped us get a trailer because uh, we were doing setup and tear down. And uh, God, God came through. Um, there's times like I wanted to rent a church. There's a church space I wanted to rent one time. Um, and the realtor, like she was really selling it. Hey, you know, this is be perfect for a church, right? And I'm looking at it and, you know, we're, I was tired of the setup and tear down. I was like, okay, you know, this is before, you know, Old Town Spring. And um, she was really selling it. And something in my spirit just said like, hey, go and talk to, you know, the neighbors or whatever. So I went into the shop next door um, after she left and they were like, don't don't rent this place. Like there's rumors they're about to tear this whole complex down. 
And man, several months later, they did just that. I had to battle not to be really angry with that woman that had, you know, was trying to get us to rent out that place. Anyways, um, God has stopped two coffee shops, friends of mine, from coming into the church. I mean, even little things like that, I look to God and I, I, I realize it's God's leading. I might not understand it in the moment, you know, um, but um, he's prevented it twice where it's almost both times almost happened. And then, and then it doesn't. And I see God accidental meetings, like running into people. And then you find out later that that was a divine meeting. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, God's done that. And just like for me, other things that I needed at the right time, books that I've read, the list just goes on and on how God has um, met me where I am and, uh, and given me his direction. Uh, we're getting ready to close here. I realize I'm going late. Um, you know, Nabil had a, uh, a dream, another dream, while he was sick with, with cancer. He said in that whole time that he had those first three dreams, it wasn't like he saw Jesus like appearing to him. But he always thought it'd be cool, like, to actually see Jesus in, in a dream, you know. Um, and, you know, he's, he's Islamic. Dreams are a big deal uh, in the Islamic faith. And, uh, you know, he's praying, you know, why he had cancer. You know, I'd love to see, you know, I'd love to see you, Lord, in a, in, in, in a dream. And uh, as God granted it to him, he was sitting in this uh, indoor balcony of this large building. And actually, he's from, he was from Houston. Um, so he was saying it was kind of like in Houston, we have the Galleria. And it was like, he says, I don't think it was the Galleria, but I was sitting on this balcony on the indoor, like third floor of a building. And it was there that Jesus appeared to me. And we had this, we had this conversation. And uh, he said, when I woke up, I couldn't remember any of the conversation. And he's like, man, I can't remember anything, you know, that he said. I guess I'll pray about it. But he says, the only thing I could remember was like Jesus was two words from the whole conversation. It was baby and sponge. And that was all that I could remember. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Katie. I was like, um, and so he decided to give his toddler a sponge bath. He told his wife, he's like, I think we should give, uh, I can't remember his name or da their daughter. I think we should give her a sponge bath. And so he, he went to work and all day he was looking forward to give, getting home and, and, and just, you know, uh, giving his daughter this, uh, this sponge bath and just see <laughs> where it goes from there. And so he got there and they got her in the tub and he pulls out the sponge and she is terrified. No, 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 no. She won't, don't want to have anything to do. Uh, with the sponge, don't want to be touched with it. And he says she stood up in the bathtub and she ran to the back of the bathtub and was facing the wall and just kind of looking over her shoulder, you know, like, please, please don't touch me with that thing. And she was terrified and he was so disappointed because he had been looking forward to giving her the sponge bath and he didn't understand. So he wasn't able to give her the sponge bath and he walked away. He's like, what am I supposed to do with that, God? So he realized it was prophetic. And... Um, what he realized was that he had feared the cancer so much that he wasn't allowing God's cleansing effect through it. That God was wanting to work in his life and make him stronger in his faith and continue his sanctification process and do a transforming work in him. But he was so afraid of the cancer and so focused on that that he wasn't growing from it. What a powerful lesson. I mean, that's not really the point of, of the, the sermon, but, but think about it. Think about this. We can allow fear and frustration. I've shared with you all plenty of my anxiety moments, right? But we can allow fear and frustration to keep us from God's transformation. And Nabil said, he says, now, you know, don't mistake. I don't believe that God gave me that cancer. But as you guys know, he, 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 he uses it. And he will use it for our good if we allow him to. And that's what God was telling him is like, hey, you're so focused and you're so afraid that you're not allowing me to do the work that I want to do in you. And just think about any trials that we're going through. Are we allowing God to, are we, are we, are we, are, are we open to learning from it, right? And growing from it. Are we allowing God, it to have its, as the Bible says, it to have its full effect on us. But also the point is, is that, you know, while experiences may be subjective, I've learned this hard lesson has taken a long time, 
don't discard them. I came from a charis- very charismatic background, right? And uh, out of that background, I wanted to go the whole other way. Didn't want to have anything to do with any of that stuff. And I feel like God has taken me, taken me right back to a better place and, and to the middle, you know. Just because you may have had bad experiences with experiential things does not mean that God doesn't work in, in that way. And so I encourage you, although sometimes it's subjective, don't discard it. Because if you do that, you're going to limit what God can do in your life and what he wants to do in your life. Because God is, again, he's not contained in a Bible. This is the word of God, the written word of God, but God is not contained in the Bible. He's living and active and he's a personal God, right? That's the reason he's given us the Holy Spirit is because he is working in each of our lives. A powerful God that cannot be boxed in. I've been guilty, but I encourage you, don't limit God. So, finally, I want to ask you a few questions. Is God trying to lead you somewhere this morning? Is he trying to uh, give you direction? And maybe it's a place, maybe it's a different direction than what you expected. Or maybe it's a different direction than what, you, than what you wanted. You know, sometimes we're so quick to say God told me when it's actually what we want to do. <laughs> and, and so it's easy to step out and do either A, like we just really want to do something. And so, hey, God told me this. Or, again, we step out in our anxiousness, right? It's like the, uh, you know, uh, jobs I've had or the church, right? Stepped out in anxiousness because I wanted to escape, Right? And so it would have been easy, although I still stepped out and I should have stayed, it would have been easy for me to say, no, God told me I need to go. But really, it's out of my anxiety. It's really something that I, I'm feeling driven to do and, and, and not what God is, is telling me. So it, sometimes we're quick to say God told me when, thing, when it's things that we want to do, but we're resistant when God is trying to lead us somewhere that we don't want to go. And so I just ask you to be open to that. And God's not the author of, of, of confusion. I believe, I believe that you'll know in your spirit if you stop and ask God, hey, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you want? God will lead you. God will lead you. Trust him. And then a couple more things. I encourage you to be obedient. You know, sometimes, and those are just some of the stories uh, in and I feel like Brad, he's not here. He's really good at this, just making a fool of himself sometimes. Um, I'm not calling Brad a fool. I'm, I'm saying this in a good way. <laughs> Being a fool for Christ because he's willing to step out in faith uh, sometimes and do foolish things. And you know, in my life when I've done that, sometimes, yeah, you're going to look like a fool. And I believe it's for the glory of God. Right? Paul, Paul said something to the effect, if we seem crazy, it's, hey, it's for God. <laughs> you know, but other times when we, when we step out in faith, man, God meets us where we're at, you know, when, I, when, I've, when I've stepped out and, and, and just trusted him, right? And so maybe God is wanting you to share something with somebody. Maybe he's laid somebody on your heart and he's telling you to reach out, you know, and uh, I encourage you to do so and just trust him. Step out and courage. And then finally, as we close, I just want to ask you uh, this last thing. I think it's a good practice as we close. Who's God laying on your heart right now? Like, who's the first person that comes to mind right now? This is a practice in just trusting God, right? That he's, he's here and he's with us. Whoever just came to your mind, right? As we close in, in worship, and Katie, you can come on up. As we close in this worship time, I want you to take the rest of our time uh, until we dismiss. And I want you to focus on that person. And I want you to pray for them. Because God, I believe God, the Holy Spirit, laid them on your heart this morning. All right? Let's pray and worship.